My God is awesome. He can move out to me. Oh, 
harm is. Lord, and you know I got the Hebrew. Hey, eleven and one, the kind of faith, yeah. Oh, Lord, it's
Good evening and welcome to the Magnolia Park Church of Christ. We're so excited that you are here with us on this evening as we once again study God's word. Let us begin this evening by going to God in prayer. Almighty Father, we come unto thee as humbly as we know how. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble ourselves for the purpose of studying your word. Bless us, Father God, as we endeavor to dig deeply into the word of God and pull out the pearls that would help to assist us in living a righteous life before you, O oh God. Understand, understanding your principles and precepts as it is our desire to grow closer to you, Heavenly Father. Forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, purify our hearts and minds, help us to come together in unity with the one purpose of serving you, O oh God. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity and the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us all the days of our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. And so once again, we are endeavoring to study from the lesson series, Spiritually Strong. This lesson series is focused on the spiritual disciplines. And as we have constantly uh, reminded you the spiritual disciplines are primarily habits, practices, and experiences that you as a Christian endeavors to develop and grow in and strengthen yourself in these qualities of the spirit. With the idea it conveys to build spiritually strong members of the body of Christ. Just as a muscle builder would exercise his physical body, our endeavor is to exercise our spiritual body, to gain an inner strength and a connection to where God is. As we engage and work out to train our spirit uh, and to become more like Christ. Looking at our personal, our inward, as well as our interpersonal and community uh, practice spiritual disciplines. There are multiple facets of spiritual disciplines which we have engaged you with thus far. And the first that we have engaged you with included the internal spiritual disciplines, which included meditation, prayer, fasting, Bible study, and chastity. And on last week, we began our discussion regarding external disciplines, where we began to talk to you from the idea of service. Tonight, we're going to talk to you from the idea of stewardship. And our focus will be on that facet of the external disciplines. And as we look at the external disciplines as a whole, they are focused not so much inwardly, but they are focused externally to the extent that they affect those we come in contact with. And in the future, we will have additional discussions regarding corporate disciplines. And so let's get into our discussion about the external spiritual discipline of stewardship. When we look at spiritual discipline of stewardship, five areas of stewardship, time, talent, treasure, truth, and relationships. And when we consider stewardship, it is a mindset that we own nothing, but rather we are the individuals that take what God owns 
and we use it to give him glory. Another way to look at it is we are ambassadors. We are managers of the affairs of another who is God himself. Church, you certainly ought to say amen because God has chosen you. You are his elect and he is utilizing you for his purpose because you are a steward working on behalf of almighty God. And so as we tried to convey to you from the perspective of a working definition of stewardship, we first need to look at the Greek word uh, that conveys the idea of stewardship. Oikonomia, oikonomia, which we derive the word economy. And this word means management of someone's household. It's primary responsibility that is entrusted to someone to manage the goods, the household, uh, the business of somebody else. So you see a steward acts as someone's administrator of the affairs and possessions of another. Stewards are, as a result, fully accountable to the master. So when we convey this as it relates to members of the body of Christ, we are wholly accountable to God for our actions. Everything that we do, we act upon God's authority because he is the master. And we may act justly as Joseph did as he was working in Potiphar's house as a steward. Genesis chapter 39, verse four through six, or vice versa, we can act unjustly as in Christ's parable of a steward who squandered his master's possessions. And so the great thing about God is he gives us free will. We can choose to be stewards that are just and obedient, or we can choose to be stewards that are unjust and disobedient. The choice is an individual choice that you and I make whether or not we are going to adhere to the wishes and the desires and the will of Almighty God. So when we talk about stewardship, one of the frameworks or facets deals with time. Time waits for no man. Time is a possession we don't own, nor do we determine. We work in a seven day week of which each of those days possess 24 hours. And what we ought to do in every 24 hour cycle is we ought to be putting God first. He ought to be the first thing on our mind. He ought to be our first priority. And so as we look at the idea of managing our time that we give God the glory in everything that we do and we make him the priority, we understand that scriptures uh, encourage us to invest our time wisely. Scriptures remind us that God determines the length of our stay here on earth. And therefore what we must do is while we're here, we ought to be focused on him. We ought to be careful as to how we conduct ourselves, how we live our lives, how we walk in the light as he is in the light and not as men that are unwise, 
but we ought to walk as men who are wise and understand our relationship to Almighty God, and therefore making the most of our time here on earth to give him the glory, because the days are evil and our number of days here on this earth are numbered, and only God knows those number of days. And so just as the wise are effective at budgeting financial resources, it is also incumbent of us to be wise as it relates to budgeting and using the time God gives us. God gives us all the resources that we need for this side of life. And time is obviously one of those. And so we have to prioritize how much quality time do we spend with the Lord? How much quality time do we spend with our spouse and our children? How much quality time do we spend with our non-Christian friends? And God wants us to obviously be faithful stewards and not waste time because our days here on this planet are numbered. And therefore, we must be accountable to God for every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, and every year that we are here on this side of life. Time as a facet of stewardship, stewardship as a facet of external uh, spiritual discipline. Talent. Now, God provides us with our talents. These are what God entrusts to us as our aptitude, our abilities, and what we are good at. And we ought to be stewards of what he's blessed us with. Now, if you can sing like a bird, then you ought to use that capacity of being able to sing and harmonize to the glory of God. If you're able to be a great administrator, then you ought to take that aptitude and use it for God's glory. If you can teach the Bible, then you certainly ought to take that skill and use it to give God the glory. If you can sweep, mop, and vacuum, and you can do that expertly, then you ought to certainly use those skills to give God the glory. Simply put, if God has given you a skill, an ability, an aptitude, a talent, don't waste it. Use it for God's glory. You see, this is true not only from the standpoint of music, artistic, athletic, academic, business, uh, and persuasive talents, but also as it relates to spiritual gifts we've received. Since we have gifts that are different according to God's grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. God made us all different and he put us together knowing that the different skills that we have ultimately complement one another and make the church better. We ought to not all be feet. We'll trip over ourselves. We ought to not all be hands. We won't be able to walk anywhere. We ought to not all be eyes. All we can do is see. We can't smell, taste, or touch. We ought to not all be ears. All we could do is hear. 
but we couldn't talk. So who would be speaking? Come on, y'all. God has given us a diversity of skills and abilities and talents. We ought to use those talents to give God the glory and to work together as a body of Christ to complement and build upon each other's talent. The third point here is faithful stewardship of our natural talents and our spiritual gifts requires that we use them on purpose, intentionally, to give God the glory. And not only to give God the glory, but to edify and encourage and build up the body of Christ. That's why there's such a diversity of gifts, because they complement one another and they help to build each other up and support one another. Our purpose is not to please ourselves with the talents God has given us, but it is to give the one who gave us the talent all the glory. And so if God has made you a preacher, bruh, preach on. If God has made you a song leader, sing on. If God has made you a teacher, well then teach on. He has enriched you with those talents and those talents are to be used for edification in the glory of God. And so the next facet related to stewardship is treasure. You see, we have been entrusted with a multifaceted stewardship. But scripture particularly stresses that treasure, treasure is financially related. It's financial resources that God has blessed us because everything that's good comes from God. And yes, money is good, but the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money, but when you love it more than you love God, there's something wrong going on. And so God blesses us with resources and we ought to be stewards of that resource. That money that God gives us, what do you do with that? Do you waste it and spend it? Just as the prodigal son did, he asked his father for his inheritance and he wasted it. He was not a good steward of it. So much so, he had to come back home and repent, ask his father to forgive him. His father allowed him to come back home. But the idea that we are given these financial resources, we ought to be wise and use those financial resources uh, for the benefit of the church. And how we look at those resources depends on our values, not the values of society, but the values that are found in God's word. And then God knew we would have trouble managing money, that we would spend a great amount of time earning, spending, and investing. But the question is, are you investing? Are you spending it in the areas that God would have you to do so? Now, my Bible is clear. Your Bible is clear. As God has, you ought to give as God has prospered you. And then when we put that in context, we are to do better than the scribes and the Pharisees. And so we, if we give as God has prospered us, and we, we ought to do better than the scribes and the Pharisees, we understand that the scribes and the Pharisees gave 10% of what God had blessed them. And so we ought to be willing 
to give more than 10%. And there's no limit. If you want to give 100% to God, go right ahead. If you want to give 50% to God, go right ahead. You want to give 20% to God, go right ahead. But what you ought to do is exceed what the scribes and the Pharisees uh, did, and that was 10%. And we have an example in the Bible uh, where the poor widow woman gave a mite, which was less than a penny in today's society, but that's all she had. She gave 100 percent of everything she had as an offering. So what does that say about us and what we're willing to do? As I said, there's guidance and the guidance is based on give as God has prospered us. But that is in context in that we ought to do better than the scribes and the Pharisees. And they gave 10%, we ought to do better than that. And so if we can get straight on the principles of 100% ownership, then guess what? We will be ready for the principle of 100% stewardship. This simply means if we understand that God owns us 100%, means that he's responsible for taking care of us, then we shouldn't have a problem to give back to God what he gave us because he's the owner of it. He's the owner of everything we have. You think you're the one that made yourself enriched and built that big house on the mountain and got all them cars and all that money in a bank. No, that was God that prospered you. If God prospered you and blessed you like that and you certainly ought to be a blessing to God and his people and be willing to, as a steward, give back to God as he's prospered you. So the next item we want to focus on is truth. And we don't really think about truth as a matter of stewardship. But you got to remember that as a member of the body of Christ, as a saint of God, we are ultimately accountable for everything. Everything that we do. And so we have to be cautious as to our conduct. And if God is true, then we ought to be truthful. The scripture teaches us Reprove, correct, and train us in righteousness so that we may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Then, since we are stewards of truth, it is our responsibility to remain students of the word through consistent exposure to scripture. And the word of God is truth. And so if the word of God is truth, as we engage the word of God, we ought to also represent that truth in our conduct and how we walk on this side of life and how we live. Are we living a life that's reflective of the word of God, which is true. Therefore, are we being truthful? Because God can see us. He knows exactly who we are, whether we are attempting to hide and put a mask on who we are. God can see straight through it. He knows who you are. So be truthful. And then there's the idea of relationships, stewardship as a relationship. You see, stewards learn to leverage, to 
the resources that they receive for eternal good. And see, this is accomplished by learning and living the word of God and by investing in the lives of others. What do I mean by that? So, as a member of the church, God has blessed you immensely. You don't have to worry about paying your bills. You've got sufficient amount of finances. You don't have to worry about going to work because God has blessed you and you are retired. You don't have to worry about where you live because God has secured you and you live well in a great neighborhood and your safety is protected. Then there are others in your same circle of friends that are not blessed like that. And it's because God has put so much in your hand. You have to be willing based on your relationships, who God has put in your inner circle and in your circle to be able to understand that those resources he's put in your hand, not just for you. Those resources are to help others and to be a blessing to others. And the only way you can do that is by having a relationship with others. When we look at the example of the rich man, this rich man said to himself, I have done well, my barns are full, I'll build another barn. And what does God say? This night, First of all, he calls a man, thou fool. This night, your soul will be required of you. The idea is this rich man didn't even consider God, didn't even consider others, and didn't even have a second thought that maybe God had blessed him with all that he had so he could help somebody else that was not blessed like that. He could then be a blessing to somebody. And what we can learn from that parable is that God blesses us in such a mighty way, then we ought to be a blessing just like God has blessed us to somebody else. You see, the scripture teaches people are eternal beings who are appointed to a resurrection of life or a resurrection of judgment. And since this is so, the time we invest in cultivating relationships by loving others and blessing others is important. And as stewards of what God has given us, people in our lives, we ought to develop those relationships we ought to come in contact and embrace those individuals and love them and become a blessing to them in whatever manner we can. And it doesn't always have to be money. It could be you are skilled in a way that that person is not skilled. And because of your skill, you can help them and be a blessing to them. It doesn't always have to be money. And so this brings us to the last area that I want to talk about tonight. And so one of the great examples that's conveyed in the word of God regarding stewardship is found in Matthew chapter 25. It is the parable of the talents. In Matthew chapter 25, uh, we see 
in verses 14 through 30. These words, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents and another two and another one. And to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. And then he that had received the five talents went and traded it with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And the Lord repeated the same thing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Okay, and then we proceed to look at the servant that had only one talent. And he took his out of fear and buried it. What did the Lord say? His Lord answered, said unto him, thou wicked, slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I soweth not and gather where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury, with interest. So the idea regarding stewardship is this, this one principle. What God has blessed you with, you ought to be productive to be a blessing to God. And if he gave you a talent, you ought to use it to give God, give back to God, not only what he, what he gave you, but more. We ought to be productive, fruit-bearing Christians. And what I mean by that, if you have received the word of God, it is implanted in you, you ought to be as a tree that grows and produces and bears much fruit as a sign and a blessing to almighty God that you're thankful to him and you are willing to take what he has given you and use it for the kingdom. And as we close this evening, I point you to three scriptures as it relates to stewardship. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 29, for unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that have not shall be taken away even that which he hath. A good steward brings abundance back to his master. He's fruitful, and he blesses his master based on what his master has given him. We ought to be a blessing to God. First Peter chapter four and verse 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Look, the blessings that God has given you with, we ought to be willing to bless others. And then lastly, Luke chapter 16, verse 11. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, 
who will commit you to, tr to, to trust the true riches? You can't be faithful. How can you expect God to bless you? And how can you be trusted to be committed to the true riches and the glory of God? We ought to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. This is our lesson this evening. We are so glad that you have decided to be with us. We want to use this opportunity in our last 10 minutes uh, to extend the invitation. There may be someone in our audience that does not share our life faith. We want you to know that salvation is full and free and salvation comes solely from God. Through his son, Jesus Christ, who died on Calvary's cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb and on the third day rose again. He gives us all the opportunity to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is Jesus Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. What you need to understand is you must first hear the word of God. You must believe what is said. You must then repent of your sins. You must confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And upon your confession, we will then baptize you for the remission of your sins. You'll go down in the watery grave as a sinner, but you'll come up as a saint. All things shall pass away. All things shall become new. The opportunity is yours on this evening to receive the gift of salvation from Almighty God. Simply give me a call, 305-778-6019, or send me a text, 305 Seven seven eight six zero one nine. So we all sing the invitation song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed? In the blood of the Lamb, are you washed? Are you washed? In the blood, in, in the, the blood, blood, in the soul cleansing blood of, of the, the Lamb, Lamb, of the Lamb. Are you gone? Must spotless are the white as snow. Are you washed? In the blood of the Lamb. We certainly thank you for being here with us on this evening. As we dismiss, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before your throne. We thank you for allowing us to assemble ourselves. We ask God as we leave this place this evening and go to our separate homes that you bless us, that you watch over us, that you protect us and that you keep us until we meet again. In Jesus Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it except love me back. Good night. <laughs>